Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm back today with another Scary Story Saturday video. I've decided that there's like a new theme of videos that I want to do on Saturdays. So obviously I'm doing true crime on a Tuesday, which I love to do. And the Scary Story Saturdays, I've decided that I want to start looking into some real haunted houses and the things that are haunting them basically. So what happened in these true hauntings? I've decided to start off the series with a really interesting one. Some of you will have definitely heard of it. It's huge. It's actually the house that inspired the first series of American Horror Story, the Murder House one, which is one of the best ones in my opinion. And it is the Los Feliz Murder Mansion. This Spanish style mansion is on the hillside in Los Feliz, which is in Los Angeles, like a really nice area in Los Angeles. And when I started researching this, I was thinking, Los Feliz, that sounds familiar. And then I realised that I'm pretty sure that I just heard it mentioned on Selling Sunset, which is on Netflix about real estate in LA. And I'm pretty sure that they went to look at a house that was in Los Feliz. And it's such a coincidence that I've literally just watched that. And now I'm reading about a house that's there, a murder house that's there. So what a coinky dink. But anyway, it was built by Harry Schumacher in 1925 and it was designed by an architect named Harry Wiener. It's built over three stories. It had four master bedrooms, three bathrooms, a library, a ballroom with a bar in it, a three car garage, perfectly terraced lawn and like an immaculate garden. Like the, the gardens surrounding the house were just like, perfectly groomed. It was just an incredible looking house. After Schumacher passed away, the house was auctioned a few times locally before it was eventually sold to the Perelson family. In the 1950s, the house was owned by Dr. Harold Perelson and he was a doctor specialising in cardiothoracic surgeries. And he lived in the house with his wife Lillian and their three children. Judy was 18, Joe, sometimes referred to as Joseph or Joel, was 13 and Debbie who was 11. He was extremely talented in his field. He had actually come up with a design for a syringe, like a really unique way of using a syringe and he'd got that patented. He also wrote very well respected clinical studies that were published and he was the keynote speaker at many different conferences all around the country. So he was just a really successful surgeon. On the 6th of December 1959, Harold came home from a day at work, just like completely normally, as he always would. He got himself a drink, he greeted his wife and his children, and he sat down with his drink and just chatted and watched his wife while she was wrapping up some Christmas presents while dinner was cooking in the background. Despite the fact that they were actually Jewish, they did celebrate the Christmas holiday with like co-workers and friends, and they just enjoyed the general vibe of it. So they did actually celebrate it as a family. Once dinner was ready, Lillian called the whole family to the table and they all sat and ate dinner together. And then after that, they watched a little bit of TV. Then the two younger children went off to bed. They were tucked into bed by their parents, I believe. And Judy went off to her bedroom to do a little bit of homework. And then Lillian went off to bed as well. I believe that she read her book for a little bit. And while all of this was going on, Harold stayed downstairs and he was just doing his own thing. And then when he thought that Lillian would already be asleep, he went off upstairs to bed, but he read his book for a little while, which was Dante's Divine Comedy. And then he also fell asleep. Between 4.30 and 5am, Harold woke up and I think his book was still on him. So he picked it up where he'd left it and propped it up. He had like a book stand thing that you could leave a book open on, on his bedside table. So he left it on there and he left it open to a passage that read, midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within the dark forest for the straightforward pathway had been lost. He went down to the kitchen where he had a little toolbox and he picked out a ball peen hammer, which is usually typically used to manipulate and bend metals. And he returned back upstairs to the master bedroom. He looked down at Lillian for a moment while she was sleeping. He raised the hammer and in one swift motion, he brought it down onto her head. There was blood 
everywhere. It covered the bed, it was all over the wall behind the bed and she was left completely unrecognisable. She reportedly actually suffocated in her own blood. Harold then left the master bedroom and went into Judy's bedroom, their 18 year old daughter. And I believe that she was still awake. She'd sort of heard a bit of commotion, I think. So when Harold came into the room holding the hammer, she went to protect herself. So he attempted to hit her over the head with the hammer too, but she raised her arms up and she sort of managed to protect her head a little bit with the hammer sort of coming against her arms, but he did get her on the head a bit, which did make her disorientated and a little bit out of it for a second. But while this attack was happening, she was obviously screaming because her dad had just walked in with a hammer. And this woke up Debbie, her younger sister. Debbie was coming out of her bedroom and Harold heard that this was happening. So while he thought that Judy was incapacitated after attacking her, he went out and spoke to Debbie and he said, go back to bed, baby. This is just a nightmare. So she turned around and wandered off. Harold then returned to Judy's bedroom, but she had managed to gain some composure back and ran out of the house and stumbled her way across to her neighbor's house. And her screaming had actually woken up the neighbors. So they were kind of up looking around and they were stood near the front door when she arrived. So they opened the door straight away. They saw her bloody head. And so they called the police immediately. Debbie luckily was a smart little girl and she didn't believe that she was dreaming. So she actually snuck into her brother's room, got him and they both snuck out of the house and ran away to safety as well. So Harold by this time knew that the police were likely to be coming for him. So he went upstairs into one of the bedrooms and he took a bottle of pills and he consumed the entire bottle. Sometimes it's actually reported that it was a bottle of acid that he drank, but I don't believe that that is actually what happened. I'm pretty sure it was a concoction of different pills. There are also conflicting reports about whether he was in one of his daughter's beds or whether he was in the master bedroom. So he was on the bed next to Lillian's body, but apparently he was barely alive and barely conscious at the time that the police arrived at the house. Some reports also say that one of the neighbors went to the house before the police arrived and saw Harold and he seemed very agitated. And so the neighbor suggested that he go and just lay down. And apparently he did do that and the neighbor saw him go off into one of the bedrooms, which is obviously when he took the bottle of pills and consumed them all. But not all sources mention the neighbor doing this. So it's not 100% confirmed whether that happened or not. During the investigations on the deaths in the family, there was a lot of evidence pointing towards the family being in a financial struggle. And they were kind of thinking that maybe Harold snapped under the pressure of owing a lot of money and having a really expensive big house to look after. And so he thought the only thing he could do was just murder his whole family in a murder suicide, just to get out of a difficult situation. Things had apparently gone downhill with his business partner. So with the patent for the new syringe that he was working on, he was invested in that with a partner who then I think just decided that he wanted the whole share of it, which is absolutely ridiculous to think that you can do that. And there was a court battle and legal proceedings going backwards and forwards. And Harold had asked for $100,000 compensation for this, but he actually got closer to $24,000, which wasn't as much as he wanted. So maybe he was really relying on the $100,000 to get him out of a financial bind. And when police were investigating the property, they looked into Judy's car and they actually found a note that she'd written to her auntie and it said, my parents, so to speak, are in a bind financially. And she was actually looking for work herself so that she could help to provide for the family and just help them out. It's also widely speculated that Harold suffered a lot with his mental health and he had spent some time in various hospitals but it was always under the pretense of something else. So it was kind of kept a secret this was a long time ago, so mental health was barely spoken about. So it would have been embarrassing for this successful doctor to admit that he was struggling. So it was always 
pretending that it was something else, like a different medical ailment that meant he had to go to hospital. But apparently Lillian was also trying to get him committed to get him some help as well. But this happened before that was successfully done. It's very lucky that Judy managed to escape the house and call the police. And it's super lucky as well that Joe and Debbie were so fast thinking and just thought to get out of the house. It's so lucky that they did that. And then they went on to live with some family members. And I think Judy stayed around the area but I'm not 100% sure. And she actually made a full recovery, which is incredible. Once the talk of this horrible crime had kind of died down a little bit, the house was put up for auction and it was bought by Julian and Emily Enriquez, but they didn't actually ever move into the house. They used it as kind of like a storage place. So they would just come by every now and again with boxes to keep in that house that they didn't want at their real house which is interesting. Why would you spend a lot of money on a house just to use it as a storage place? I don't know. Maybe they were too scared to stay there because apparently they never even stayed the night once in that house. The neighbors were a little bit annoyed about this because the house was starting to become in disrepair. Like it was just getting run down. It had a lot of work that needed doing to it. Obviously for years, it was just sat there being a storage place and people started to go around to the house and like squatters would be in the garden and homeless people would be in the garden. And apparently prostitutes would also use the house for their work, which the neighbors didn't enjoy. Apparently the Perelson's possessions remained in the house as they were just untouched for years. Emily and Julian just weren't really too bothered. They just kind of put their boxes amongst the stuff and they left the Christmas tree that was there in the house and also wrapped up presents were still in the house because obviously the night that Lillian was murdered, she'd been wrapping up Christmas presents while chatting with Harold in the living room. So they just left that kind of stuff just in the house for years. And then in 1994, Emily and Julian passed away. So the house was passed down to their son, Rudy, who also never moved in, annoyingly, to the neighbours. He also just used it as a place to store stuff. He didn't do anything to it, he just had no interest in it. But apparently he used to say that he didn't understand why people would always come around to look at the house because it wasn't haunted or anything. He just thought it was pointless that people did that. The only thing that Rudy did do to the house was install some security cameras and things just because he knew that people were sort of breaking in and using it as a place to sort of spend the night. So yeah, that's all he did, put some cameras in just to keep an eye on it and make sure that no one was stealing stuff. But that is literally all he did. Obviously, paranormal investigators were very keen to go to the house and have a look because it was the home of such a gruesome murder-suicide. And there are reports that there are a lot of orbs in the house. You would hear voices and whispers and even screams. And it is very common to hear a woman's voice in the early hours of the morning shouting no in a frantic, screamy voice. And it would go silent for a second and then you would kind of hear moaning and groaning as though somebody was really distressed and sad and that was a man's voice. So people think that they are actually hearing the murder and what happened that night between Lillian and Harold. Ghost hunters also report seeing people in the windows from the outside of the house. So they would stand on the street and look up into the windows and see a person stood there and they would try and take pictures and things of these figures. And when they would get them developed, because this was years ago, remember, before camera phones, they would get them developed, or they would go and like look back at their images and there would be nothing there. So they never managed to catch anything on film. But people did say that they would see figures and the figure would look back at them for a couple of minutes and then just disappear. A lot of people have said that they felt really negative energy, even just from the outside of the house. And they just felt as though they needed to get away. Like it was just a very negative place to be around. The Los Feliz murder mansion sold again in 2016 for $2.3 million, even though it was so run down by this point, like $2.3 million, wow. That just shows that house prices in the area are ridiculous. 
And they had all of these plans to renovate and do a load of really cool stuff to the house because they wanted to move in. Apparently they even wanted their master bedroom to be the same master bedroom as Lillian and Harold. So they would literally be sleeping in the same place that he murdered his wife, which is just lovely. But things were proving to be too difficult. So the plans that they had didn't match up with what they could actually do. And the money was just getting crazy and they would have had to have knocked down massive areas and rebuild things because it just didn't work with the landscape with it being on the hillside. So they kind of just scrapped that idea and it ended up going back on the market. It's still on realtor.com now for two and a half million dollars. So if you've got a spare two and a half million and you want a murder house, <laughs> Go and have a look, that'll be cool. <laughs> and the listing on this website and online that you can see quite often shows all of the rooms like completely ripped out. They're all just like wooden like beams to like hold everything up. So there's like no flooring or anything. It's literally a shell now ready for someone to buy it to completely renovate the whole of the inside. Like it's ready to go. It just needs somebody to not mind living in a murder house. It's still listed as having the library and the ballroom, that's all still in there, and the three car garage, all still the same, but it lists it now as having five bedrooms instead of the four, so at some point another bedroom has appeared, and that it also has three bathrooms. So that is all of the information on the Los Feliz murder mansion, which is just really crazy. I find it mad to think that it's in, LA in like a really fancy bougie neighborhood because it's a it's a murder house like it's such a scary thing that happened there and nobody will ever know what it was that made Harold do that whether it was just his mental health got the better of him whether he was just struggling with the finances and thought that was the only way out for the family whether he was sleepwalking and he was in some kind of weird trance and he tried to do it. No one is ever gonna know what happened and it's completely bizarre. I just find it insane. But that is the end of today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed looking into this. I found it so interesting and there are so many haunted houses and buildings around the world that I can do videos on. So I'm so excited that I've thought about this. So I'm really looking forward to that. The next video that I'm gonna do in this little series, I've already decided that it's gonna be the Lizzie Borden house because that's always been a case that's really interested me. So I would love to research it a little bit for a video. And I'm also super excited because at the end of this month, there's actually gonna be a live stream from the Lizzie Borden house for four days. So 24 hours every day for four days. They're doing a live stream so they'll have cameras and things set up and they'll be doing like seances and Ouija boards and all these kind of things in the house just to see what happens. And it's run by the same people who did the Conjuring live stream, which I filmed my reaction video to a few months ago. It's actually my most popular video on this channel. So I'm definitely doing the next one. And I just thought it would be quite nice if I could put a little bit of context to the Lizzie Borden house on my channel before I do the live stream of it. I think that makes sense. So definitely look out for that one. I will be back with another video in a couple of days. If you like this kind of stuff, definitely subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. Smash the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this and I will see you in my next one. Bye.